This is Digital Music Trends, episode 127, recorded on the 10th of April 2013. This week on the show, video is in, BBM music is out, lovely infographics from the BPI and Pandora, Gema's new fees for DJs, and much more. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, the weekly show covering the latest news in the music tech industry. DMT is available as audio and video on iTunes, most podcasters, SoundCloud, YouTube, Stitcher, Mixcloud and TuneIn Radio. So this week on the show I'm really happy to uh, welcome Tom Davenport, freelance journalist writing for a variety of publications. So hi Tom and great to have you on, how's it going? Very well, thanks for having me on. Well, uh, thanks for being on, and it's just us two today because unfortunately I had a, a Virginia Berger scheduled on the show, but uh, she had uh, internet connectivity issues, so, so she couldn't uh, make uh, the Skype call. Uh, and so, but it's actually quite a busy week, so I think uh, between the two of us we should be able to uh, cover all the topics. And so let's start by talking about video, which is uh, not a digital music service at all, but it's very much part of the picture. So after years of rumors, uh, the service is finally uh, gone live in the US and UK just for audio premium subscribers and uh, just a couple of weeks after we mentioned the Spotify rumor uh, in connection to uh, Spotify possibly being uh, in the process of uh, working on a video service. Uh, so it's interesting that the that, uh, video service is now finally online, uh, but surprisingly it doesn't follow Ardio's footsteps uh, in terms of model because it's a pay-per-view service. And uh, of course, you know, we were discussing a couple of weeks back how uh, it was difficult for audio, of course, to uh, and for Spotify probably it's going to be difficult if they're working on a video service to to create a catalog large enough uh, to offer a decent subscription service. And so, a uh, pay per view seems uh, seems like a, a, a good way to go. But um, you know, first of all, uh, Tom, what are your thoughts on on launching uh, a service of this kind that is different from from uh, w- what users may have expected from a service like audio, for example? Well, I think it's a you make a good point about them not having enough of a, a catalog to have a subscription service because people are going to expect, you know, a lot of content. Um, it's something that's taken Netflix years to pick up on. Yeah, sure. I think on that same point, there's actually uh, the other reasons for adoption because it's going to be hard for people who are new customers to video. Um, uh, which is, is uh, just realised it's hard to pronounce that without being yeah, clear exactly. what service, uh, VVO, whatever you want to call it. So, um, yeah, that's true. Uh, but, but, you know, any any new entrant to the video streaming space is going to be, uh, you know, it would be ballsy to ask for a subscription, yeah. um, because not just because of the catalogue, because, you know, you're going to be a, a, a new name. Yeah. And you need to convince people to sign up to that. And there's so many subscription services popping up out of the woodwork the last yeah. couple of years that, you know, people want to have a sense that they're going to the best one. Yeah. Um, or, or, you know, they, they don't want to, you know, have to go to different places. You know, it'd be nice to have just the, the, the right one. Yeah. Um, it's not necessarily clear what the right one is. Um, at the and of course, you know, Netflix got slaughtered uh, when it launched in the UK because it didn't have enough catalog. And even then it had, you know, a decent catalog, but of course it wasn't enough for most users. So uh, so the bar is set pretty high at this point in, in, in when you launch a new, a new service, uh, at least uh, in the UK and the US. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the price points, of course, are a little bit high. Uh, our, our audio is offering 25, uh, video is offering $25 or £20, I think, of uh, free um, um, credit to uh, um, it, the audio premium consumers, and uh, I guess like what's uh, I'm interested in what the play is on, on their part. Like on the one side, you would think that there's so many outlets offering video online at the moment, uh, but I guess uh, the challenge for services like Audio, Spotify, Deezer is to really reduce the churn in users and reduce users uh, from leaving uh, that ecosystem. So I guess. There, there's some value there in keeping the users engaged in that particular ecosystem and not letting mm-hmm. them out into 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 other uh, uh, services, of course. Uh, but um, I don't know. Is that is that enough of a value to create a whole company around? Do you think there's there's money to be made in that? Oh, there's absolutely money to be made in. I, I assume you mean uh, streaming. You know, content. People are. You know, people go through content like food right now. I mean, yeah. um, you know. People have taken to streaming uh, better than a lot of people expected. A few years ago, it was a bit of a, you know, are, are people going to be okay with this? Of course, the technology and bandwidth supports this. It's kind yeah. of working. But um, when you say it's about keeping people in the ecosystem, I think it's, um, uh, 
one thing audio and video um again it's kind of that's a little hard because they don't have a a sort of umbrella brand as such yeah um so by having two different names okay they're pretty close we can see that they're you know they're related the names you know echo off each other but there, it, there's also a sense that they're two different companies. Yeah. And I think for something like Spotify, which for a long time it's looked like, you know, it's not necessarily a music-centric name. They could do other kinds of media, and the word Spotify still makes sense. Yeah. So if Spotify were to go into video streaming or even, you know, book subscriptions or that sort of thing, all for one subscription fee, I think that's, you know, that, that's the kind of thing that helps – keep people in one ecosystem because people say, well, I've got one, you know, one subscription payment going out each month for all that digital content. And they're saying, yeah, yeah. so then there's less churn. Yeah. Um, so yeah, video of course is going to be pay per, per view as far as, or stream yeah. as far as I know. Yeah. Um, and you know, p- people are loving the audio experience. So maybe the same will be true for video. Um, but, you know, time, time will tell. We, time will tell, yeah. There's a lot of lot of companies doing the same thing, so we'll see what happens. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We'll see what happens on that one. But uh, And the Spotify audio rivalry is actually heating up uh, right now. Like, uh, I'm seeing more and more articles that are highlighting the, uh, you know, the pluses of one and the pluses of the other and, you know, the deficiencies of one and deficiencies of the other. Uh, and uh, I, I myself am uh, currently a Spotify user. Um, just because I used to work in a field where I had to access a lot of tracks very quickly and sort of the, the search is just like absolutely instantaneous on the desktop client uh, for Spotify, which made a difference for me. Uh, but of course, I'm, I'm hearing a lot, of, a lot of people in the industry that are, are really, really keen on, on audio in terms of uh, user experience. And, and uh, I have to agree with them that it's, it's, a, great, it's a great interface and, and you know, a great uh, also, curation of the content uh, on the, on that front. Uh, what, what's your what's your uh, take? What, 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 who do you vote for? Uh, audio looks very nice. Uh, Spotify's got a huge. Well, they, they both got good catalogs. I mean, actually, that's the thing is, although one company might I don't know the exact numbers, but one company might be able to say we've got X million. The other company says we've got Y million. Yeah. Uh, for most people that. It's going to have pretty much all or most of the music that you want, certainly to, to mainstream taste. So the only way to differentiate is for the user experience around, you know, between that and yeah. how you, in, you literally interface with the, the, the software. Yeah. So audio seems to be getting a lot of attention for having a nice interface. You know, companies like Apple have proven that in the long term that's something people go for. You know, people like... Uh, pe- people maybe it's more I could say actually people don't like having difficulty with software. I think a good interface isn't necessarily like wow this is nice. It'll, it'll often more be an absence of not enjoying it. If you remember back to the days yeah. of Windows XP, and I think personally I found myself banging my head on yeah. on the table with that sort of thing. So um, so yeah, audio has, has had a lot of. Uh, support since early on there was some criticism about its launch strategy in the uk early on because some people felt that it didn't do a good enough job and it you know could have made a bigger noise yeah and so some people thought they were kind of slacking a bit and you know would suffer for that but in a way whether it's intentional or not you know they've let the word of mouth kind of grow of course i'm not saying they've done no press or that they've been rubbish here. i'm not one to comment on that just no, saying sure, yeah. but but one way or another or whether it's intentional or not it's kind of proven to be a good thing because the product is speaking for itself and, and now they're coming up almost as like a, as an underdog uh, exactly. which is interesting and people yeah. love the underdog so yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Definitely. And talking about underdogs, uh, this is an underdog that didn't end very well. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, we're talking about so many new services coming on the market that are new. But unfortunately, uh, you know, Black, uh, BlackBerry's uh, uh, you know, BBM music uh, service uh, uh, ended up being cl- it, it's been announced that it's going to be closed by RIM. Uh, the service was launched in 2011, and it costs five dollars per month. Uh, the service, of course, had been panned from the very beginning in the tech press, uh, including uh, Business Insider article 
article calling it laughable, uh, given that users were only allowed to have 50 tracks uh, cached or downloaded uh, on, the, on the phone. And uh, the following month, they would have to, uh, they were only able to swap 25 tracks of those for new tracks, and they had to keep 25 of those as the old ones. Uh, there were some uh, options to build a collection if you had a lot of friends that were on the service and they could give you their tracks, and, and that was sort of the only way that you could really uh, grow uh, this pie. Uh, so that's that, that. That was kind of like a, a bit of a losing game from the beginning. So mm. uh, you know, m m what I'm wondering is whether the closure is more related to really BlackBerry's uh, need to restructure, uh, uh, <laughs> and you know, or whether it's it's a case that if they had been able to launch a better, more comprehensive service, whether this would have been would have had a, a slightly longer lifespan. I, I don't know what do you, do you reckon it's just tied to BlackBerry's decline in general. Um, I'm sure all of that would have contributed to it, but I think it's probably just because no one was using it. We can't see numbers, but I I would assume that very few people were seriously using it. If there was yeah. only 50 tracks uh, that you could use, and, and as you say, there's more to it than that. But even now, it's a fairly convoluted thing to explain. Um, so, you know, back yeah. when you know, if you're launching a service in 2011, not that long ago, um, I mean, already they're too late to really take on people seriously I think certainly you know certainly with something which sounds pretty lackluster I mean things were different then yeah um, which is why maybe it made sense for Blackberry to or Rim at the time to launch to something yeah. but it feels more like it was a kind of token music service it's like yeah. they're saying yeah we have a phone and I don't know when the decline for BlackBerry started, but they, you know, obviously they've tanked, but they were huge. A lot of people had them, you know, people in my family and friends, you know, a lot of people who, who kind of, even though iPhones and, you know, Android had started, but iPhones kind of was, were getting, you know, they were big, yeah, huge by, by 2011, you yeah. know, so even a few years before, but some people were still, you know, hanging on to their business phones and whatnot. Absolutely, so there was a yeah. lot of people there that, you know, there could have been a good music service for. But, yeah, it just I just think um, it, it was just not a good enough offering. It was just poor offering. Poor offering yeah, and, yeah. yeah. And, and now, you know, even less people are interested. So why keep it open? Why keep so, it open? Yeah, it's just yeah. a loss of money, uh, a loss of resources. And uh, the, the, the interesting side of this is that they actually recommended audio to their users as the alternative. Uh, okay. So they actually uh, they ha had some sort of deal, I guess, to offer mm. 30 days free uh, to um, um, to their users of the service if they signed uh, up for audio, uh, which uh, was a, you know an interesting um, it's an interesting uh, turn of events. It will be even more interesting, of course, if there was a deeper <coughs> partnerships in terms of uh, uh, BlackBerry actually switching to audio as their suggested. Uh, choice for music subscription for their own users yeah. although uh, at the moment i feel like it's more like a, a a way that they're sort of letting people go gently by telling them look i'm sorry we're we're stopping the service uh, but you have this this great service to that you can rely on uh, instead of us now um, but, but maybe that does suggest that, that they'll go there at some point because yeah. if they're making some kind of commitment to you know publicly say yeah audio is good uh, effectively then yeah. you know it's, it would be too early to say audio is, you know, the one to commit to and sort of let's go for a proper contract kind of deal or, you know, some kind of proper integrated yeah. tie-in. But, but it's, they're already, you know, making steps towards it if they're, you know, going on record to, you know, say that sort of thing. So that's actually a really interesting point. Yeah, and I mean, uh, of course, you know, their, dec they've, their decline is huge, but still, if they were to endorse a specific streaming service over another, it's still, we're still talking about millions of users, so it's, it's, not, it's not a bad really... Uh, catch if if that was the case mm, absolutely um, and, and it's also users that probably have the ten ten dollars a month required to to subscribe for mobile because uh, uh, most of blackboard users are business consumers so uh, so mm. that's uh, that's definitely a, a decent demographic uh, to tap into uh, and uh, so moving on from there um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the um, a YouTube uh, deal that was made last week. We talked about it on the service uh, on, on the on the on the um, show last week, uh, but uh, so I don't want to dwell on it too much. But there was a very good article by Helian Linval uh, on Digital Music News, uh, talking about the YouTube uh, SASM Universal Music Publishing deal that that we discussed, and so she and she points out how um, there are certain interesting aspects to this deal uh, that could actually provide YouTube with a little bit more leverage when it comes to the discussions with the collection societies. In particular, uh, she talks about the fact that um, 
the uh, catalog from Universal Music Publishing that uh, has been licensed is an uh, Anglo-American one, meaning from a uh, British or American collection society. And this actually means that uh, the tracks that have contributions from societies that don't have a deal with YouTube, like STEM in Sweden, for example, uh, that Helian is a member of, uh, uh, are not considered as part of the deal. So uh, point A, some of, some, a lot of tracks are, uh, of course, discarded because not, not all the rights are cleared. And also the interesting thing is that the territoriality of the deal is that it's it's um, works for 127 territories uh, which uh, allows youtube to monetize the tracks that are part of the deal in a number of different countries but some of those territories don't yet have a deal on a national level uh, with the collection society of that particular country uh, with youtube so that means that uh, they could be in a situation where uh, some of the content that they have the rights for uh, gets advertising and gets monetized whilst the content from the local artists um, because mm. the collection society doesn't have a deal with youtube is not monetized and so her point is that uh, there could be a, a way in which YouTube can leverage that uh, to because you know artists of course are going to question their collection society and go why are you not making a deal with YouTube uh, so that we can monetize in the same way as artists in the Anglo-American markets are so uh, so a very interesting sort of um, little uh, so behind the scenes look here and uh, uh, of course you know YouTube is looking as, uh, for as much leverage as it can get to pressure collection societies to make a deal with them uh, do, do you think that, that that's a good move on, the, on their part? Um, I hesitate to say YouTube because really the, it's you know we shouldn't forget this is Google and yeah. it's Google doing the old shoot first ask questions later or you know shoot first and let other people pick up the pieces later I'm not not an anti Google sort of person but because of the, you know I'm, I'm aware of the immense amount of good that it brings to the world but uh, this whole thing reminds me of an absolutely incredible documentary on Storyville recently yeah uh, I don't know if you see sorry it was called Google and the World Brain and it was about no, Google and its practices with scanning books for Google Books, uh, but which on the surface is a very noble endeavour, and it, and it is in so many ways. But but they, it was again, it was a sort of shoot first and let you know let other people deal with the consequences later sort of thing, where a lot of copyright owners kind of got shafted. Yeah. It's a similar sort of thing now. Google has the winning card because it has YouTube. YouTube is you know. It's a winning card because YouTube is excellent. Yeah. But the people who it really affects, which is the musicians in countries or the people who aren't necessarily being represented, or they're just being at the back of the queue. Yeah. Again, now, it's not... It's a hard thing to complain about because that's just the way these things have to work. Google can't go and knock on the door of every independent musician and... Yeah. And you know, say what what deal do you want? But it's 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 it's, it's just a sorry sorry thing to see that the internet works like this, yeah. and um, yeah, sure. because of the scale of it, uh, I can give one example of um, you know one thing I see regularly on a weekly basis of how these international uh, not headaches, but Dealing with content on an international level. Yeah. Uh, on that topic, the the internet is really an international. You know, it's almost like one country. Anyone can access it, gen generally speaking. Yeah. And the the problem is, it has to operate on all these different kinds of rules, different countries, and that doesn't add up in so many ways. So yeah. I write for one site called Ultimate Guitar and it shares it's a rock music site we'll often share music videos and do top tens and uh, we'll often use YouTube to stream the music and the problem is a lot of countries can't access that so people in Germany can't hear YouTube stuff so we yeah. wherever possible we'll use SoundCloud because it does uh, you know at least can be used heard in any country but of yeah. course SoundCloud if it does there's some rumors that it'll uh, start um you know, paying royalties. I don't know what will happen there. Yeah. I think of some good reasons for it, but then one reason against it is that then it introduces a load of royalty headaches <laughs> in certain <laughs> countries, and then suddenly we've got the same problem with SoundCloud as we did with YouTube, and yeah. there's no international sort of platform to promote, uh, you promote know, music. Music, so, which is a shame. 
Yeah. So it's, again, this you know this problem, this you know recent YouTube Universal news is just it's something that's going to keep being a problem in yeah. in all kinds of aspects of the internet and. Yeah. You know, it's it's kind of a, a little helpless. I don't know that in, in our lifetime we'll really see a solution because, you, you know, there'd have to be some kind of international internet law, and it's just I don't. It's just not going to happen. It's not going to so. happen. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, you know, of course, I, I appreciate societies making a stand against YouTube when when and where it's possible, mm. uh, and it's always like you, you you know we often talk on the show about the break br breaking point where, uh, you know, where where is the breaking point where it's more. Uh, it's it's better for you to make a deal with YouTube and get that money to your uh, to, you know to your writers and, and or the the other point where it's better to hold out and try to negotiate a better deal than mm -hmm. other societies have managed to to get so far. So uh, it's, it was going to be a bit of a back and forth on that one. I'm I'm afraid and uh, and uh, uh, I know some societies have taken a really hard stance on this, uh, but I, I also don't really see Google backing down too much on it. So it's going to be very interesting yeah. to see this year what's what's going to happen on, on on that front. And mm -hmm. uh, you know of course uh, you know. Streaming and digital really reflecting in the numbers for the music industry uh, this year. The last few weeks we've been talking a lot about numbers. Uh, so there's been all sorts of reports coming out from all different countries, and every week we sort of have some sort of numbers uh, coming in to the show uh, to show us where the industry is going. And this year, uh, well, this week uh, we got uh, another three uh, sets of three or four sets of numbers. First one comes from the IFPI, which released their big uh, rec record in uh, industry numbers 2013 report, uh, which provided extensive analysis of the performance of the industry in 2012 really uh, and it is still it, it reiterates uh, the, the very slight uh, 0 0.2 0 0.3 percent growth uh, in sales uh, to 16.5 billion a number that had recently been put into question a little bit in the last couple of weeks just in light of the declines that had been reported uh, in major markets such as the US UK and Germany the justification for it is that there's actually been a real uh, great growth in some emerging markets so Brazil India and Mexico have seen a growth of 24 42 and 17 percent respectively since 2008 so uh, you know in four years really made, made some strides in in the emerging markets uh, and um and so it's not all bad news like like it seemed to be or, or you know sort of static news uh, because 22 territories uh, saw growth in 2012 uh, out of the 49 markets analyzed uh, in depth in the report uh, so you know some some good things some not not so good things uh, but uh, of course the, the the big thing here is that um, subscription revenues have uh, risen to 500 million uh, so the revenues from those services uh, uh, they've gone up by 500 million so I think it's actually gone up to 1.2 oh, yeah. billion overall. Yeah, you're so right. Sorry. So it's se seemingly almost doubled, which Absolutely. is you know kind of mind blowing. Which is, and it's 20 percent of the total recorded industries revenues in 2012, which yeah. is wow. It's a lot. It's yeah. a lot. And uh, in Europe, uh, now 31% of all digital music revenues come from uh, subscription and ad-supported services. So, so that's going to be an interesting play because like it just makes, you know. Spotify and the likes and and you know uh, and Pandora as well you know the, all the more powerful for for for, for this it's it's going to be a very interesting uh, couple of years uh, to see mm. how these numbers really skew uh, in in a different direction as well um, a, an additional study by, published by the MPD group last week uh, shows uh, another interesting f facet of this and that was taken uh, taken up also by Clyde Smith at Highpot in a in a, a good analysis of of the different uh, reports on on usage of, of uh, radio uh, for 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 users and, and internet radio of course uh, so the the study shows that uh, there's been a huge rise in use of uh, services like Pandora uh, in the 13 to 35 demographic for Q2 2012 in the US. Uh, so uh, in that demographic, uh, services like Pandora claim 23% of listening time, which is a 17% increase over 2011. And uh, it was uh, at the expense of AM FM radio, of course, uh, because that lost 2% uh, year on year. Uh, so um, and of course, both OCD, uh, CD and digital file usage were uh, in slight decline. And CD is more than, more than digital file usage, of course. Uh, so. The interesting thing here is that we see that uh, if you put together the on-demand streaming services uh, and the internet radio services uh, in terms of uh, split, uh, the um, internet radio streaming services see 50% of usage in the 13 to 35 age group uh, split between Pandora and uh, iHeartRadio. And this is, uh, of course, US statistics. Uh, and on-demand streaming trails behind uh, with Spotify at only 9%, uh, followed 
followed by surprisingly Groove Shark in the survey at, at 3%. So uh, these are very interesting numbers just because they show how important uh, Pandora Free is as a service because it's a completely free service and uh, you know it's got it's got some sort of cap now i think in 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 the us for mobile uh, streaming uh, but i don't think it has a cap on on desktop yet uh, in the us and so it's a service that people can just switch on and live on for for, for the whole day essentially with uh, with some advertising involved and uh, i think that's that's super interesting because we, we talk so much on the show about spotify audio and deezer mm. uh, and uh, i think uh, internet radio and uh, internet radio streaming which is not on demand is such a uh, it could be such a huge part of our listening habits, uh, even more so in Europe, where we don't have a company like Pandora, and so the market is really uh, mm. up for the taking. You know, uh, if we think there is a way that a company could interject and actually create a viable business out of that. So, so I don't know. Do you, do you reckon there is a space? Of course, you know, there, there's a whole host of issues in the UK uh, due to rates, and mm. that's why really nobody has entered the the. And Pandora has actually pulled out of the UK for, for that reason because the rates are too high for them. Uh, so, but but do you think there could be uh, you know a, a third market of internet radio really becoming a thing for us here, uh, whilst it hasn't been so far? Absolutely. I I want. I want something like Pandora. We d we don't have it, and it's easy to forget that this is you know completely normal in America. This is you know just as normal for streaming as it is to have on demand. We it's it's easy to overlook that because yeah. we we don't have it. Uh, it's difficult to understand what these new numbers mean for Pandora because we haven't seen them. You know, we haven't it, they haven't been part of our culture necessarily. We you know something that we would talk about with friends for the, yeah. the for those very reasons. But uh, well, one stat was it two hundred million songs just in the morning they stream before ten o'clock every morning. Uh, again, uh, USA is big country, so less surprising. But I mean, that's you know, it hits home that that's a proper radio network. That's not just you know some successful streaming platform. It, this is a proper you know, this is. Uh, I'm sure there's lots of people who just don't use radio because they're oh, yeah. getting everything they want from Pandora. And I do remember when Pandora was in the UK. This was a long time ago. I don't know when they left. I remember trying it out, and it was, it was excellent. It was the the, the one I used, and I think it's the the angle they have is that it was has this music genome project, yeah, and it seems to really work. You'd put in a song that you like or an artist, and it would genuinely seem to recommend some you know, really decent and pertinent tracks yeah. and you would get good tips from it. Uh, the only other radio service I've experienced that with is Last FM. I think their radio had been totally underrated, but I think they've suffered from poor user experience and um, I think Last FM was ahead of its time in many ways because, yeah. you know, it was amazing, but, you know, the founders left, maybe maybe that affected the vision and it kind of, by not having sort of a clear leader in, this, in the way that other newer services, so like Spotify and Daniel Ek or Daisy and Ian, uh, I forget his surname now, but, but the guy who's come from Top Spin. Uh, yeah, Rogers, yeah. Yeah, so, so, you know, by having clear leaders, then I don't know, there's something about the kind of branding and, uh, you know, That's missing. The fake people can have in a company. So last time hasn't had that. So yeah. I think the one, the interesting one could be Apple. Um, maybe they wouldn't come to the UK because uh, for the same reasons for the licensing fees. But but the rumours at the minute are that it would be some kind of radio service. And, you know, based on, well, their experience with technology, but also the the size of the iTunes catalogue, and you know the amount of content that it can immediately stream to, but then presumably let you buy in an instant. Yeah. I think that that would be compelling for a lot of people. And at the end of the day, it comes down to how good that radio stream is. Because you know, Spotify, I've never been into the radio on there. I'm not sure what's going on. Maybe it's better now, but you know, it was in, it was bad enough to put me off bothering. So <laughs> I think yes, in answer to your question, there is room. There is room for a radio for a radio service in like the UK. This. Yeah, in the UK and the rest of Europe. And of course, in you touched Europe, upon yeah. some some of some of the figures that Pandora released this week. They they, they got to the 200 million registered users milestone. They announced that yesterday uh, via blog blog post by co-founder Tim Westergreen, uh, which uh, complement was complemented with a very eye-catching infographic 
infographic on the company's achievements and actually this week was a week of the infographics because uh, we had a very lovely infographic from the uh, BPI uh, which if you go on bpi.co.uk you should be able to find still uh, uh, detailing uh, you know the, the evolution of single sales in the UK and and uh, announcing the reaching the 1 billionth download sold in the UK uh, singles wise uh, but go, going back to Pandora um, this uh, a very nice infographic revealing some of the uh, more positive figures around the company of course uh, and uh, some of them include um, you know a lot of them were actually focused on discovery like we were talking about before and and showing how much uh, Pandora can be a driver uh, towards discovery uh, so some of them uh, for example uh, were the fact that um, over a hundred thousand unique artists uh, were played with over one million individual tra tracks uh, during the month of March and uh, that was across 400 plus curated uh, genre stations uh, so uh, so that, that that's an amazing number considering how few uh, tracks how, how how many fewer tracks are played on, on traditional uh, radio of course and it really uh, shows uh, how that how the channel can be a, a real valuable discovery uh, play. Uh, Pandora of course has got you know a lot of issues to contend with and uh, uh, you know more than the 200 million registered users it, there's issues on, on profitability on, on rates on all sorts of stuff that they have to that they have to sort of deal with and also international expansion as we were talking before is a big big point because they haven't launched in some major territories uh, that, are, that are important music wise and it'll be actually interesting to see what they're going to do in Australia and New Zealand where they launched uh, um, fairly recently so there's no numbers really or breakdowns on, on, on that on that front uh, and so I mean that that's pretty much it on Pandora there wasn't really much much to talk about but going back to the one billionth uh, singles download in, in the UK uh, what do you think about that figure do, do you think it's representative of how much the market has grown because because here it's really become like a huge thing you know the digital single chart has become perhaps one of the most important indicators of of sales in the uk well i was actually kind of surprised um that it hadn't happened sooner <laughs> yeah. uh, it, it seems like a relatively low number i mean i wonder if i don't understand this am i right to think it's the one billion single digital single has been sold in the uk that's right that just seems really strange to me because I'm, I'm sure, you know, iTunes has sold billions and billions. I don't know what it's at. I, th I think it must have gone past 20 billion by now, certainly 10. But then I guess if you stack that up, you know, compared to America and other countries, and 1 billion is pretty low. So, yeah. Well, so, yeah. That's I'm, I'm kind of surprised, but, you know, may maybe it makes sense. It's hard to kind of have perspective on numbers that big sometimes. So. Uh, yeah, so, no, it's, it's interesting to look at, you know, for example, 2012, 187 million uh, singles sold, uh, you know, if you look at the UK population, it's, that's almost like the three to four tracks, the singles downloaded yeah. per person, which is still like a, a relatively yeah. good number, really. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> I think there's noise in my house. But, um, yeah, it starts to make sense when you see that, as you say, something like 187 million sold in the UK in 2012, I think you said that. Yeah, yeah. But it starts to make sense that we've only hit one billion then. Yeah. But it's... Yeah, for me, it just seems a bit it strange, just seems a bit um, you know, because you, you kind of think the internet's a bigger place, you know, there must, I'm sure a lot, I'm sure there's a lot more people getting hold of music one way or another. Yeah. It'd be interesting <laughs> to see, you know, it'd be interesting to see genuine stats for all of these different, you know, sources. Yeah. But of course, we don't, we don't really have them, but, but no, if, you know, we've got one million, no. great. That's great. Um, yeah, yeah. Sure we'll it's not bad. And, and, and they, they use it as an excuse to make a very nice infographic that we could have a look at. And it's, it's mm. lovely. Uh, and so uh, the last thing I wanted to just uh, touch upon, because it's a story that I just broke in the last few hours, is the fact that uh, German DJs uh, are now protesting against uh, a new measure taken by GEMA, uh, GEMA uh, which is the uh, collection society um, uh, in, in Germany, uh, in regards to DJs. So basically, uh, what GEMA has proposed with these new fees that were announced on the 1st of April uh, is that uh, DJs are going to have to pay for the songs that they store Mm. digitally because of course those songs wow. are are they plan on using those songs and djs have actually to be registered with gema in in germany to be able to to operate and so they, they basically added a license fee to the license fee that would have to be paid by a club uh, yeah. when the tracks are played and it's really high so like uh, you know uh, the license is uh, 13 cents of euros uh, per um, uh, per track uh, yeah. 
for 125 euros for a collection of a thousand tracks and then uh, it's 50 euros per each additional 500 tracks. So uh, looking at the number that Billboard put up, uh, it was an article by Wolfgang Spa. If you had a 15,000 music file a collection on your hard drive and you were a DJ in Germany, you would have to pay GEMA something like uh, uh, 1,500 euros per year just to have that music on your drive. Mm. And then that would be completely yeah. separate from the payment that uh, the club would have to make once you pay for the tracks. So of course, this has uh, generated a lot of protests and over 500 DJs and members of the German Paris, uh, Piracy Party have protested in uh, in Munich. Uh, so, so that's uh, that's kind of crazy. But I don't know. Uh, do you think that's something that that any other collection society would ever dare to do? It seems like something that right. only Gamer could put put together. It's yeah, crazy. It's it, it seems absolutely balmy. I'll I'll be brief because I can hear my kids making a racket out there. But <laughs> it, sure. yeah, it sounds absolutely crazy. How do they police it? Uh, if yeah. they can police it, it just criminalizes people. And it's obviously the DJs are going to find ways to hide it. So it just becomes a pain in the ass for them. So, you know, what it, it doesn't make sense on all kinds of levels. The yeah. one way where the only way I can see them justifying it is that potentially some DJs have stolen a lot of music. And in that sense, then they start to get some money back for people whose music has been stolen. Now, that would make sense. But then you're also billing people who may have bought all that music legitimately yeah so you know things are different over there maybe maybe it makes more sense in the wider context of you know music licensing there but to me it just seems absolutely balmy and how do yeah. you release it yeah it's, it's, it's kind of it's kind of strange uh, I, I i i wonder whether it's a measure that they're trying to take to counter the fact that songwriters are really pissed that they haven't made a deal with YouTube yet, so they yeah. can't make any money from there. Yeah. So they're just trying to find a different revenue stream it's and go, anything, anything. come and have this money instead. Like, we'll, we'll give you something. Yeah. <laughs> just chill out. But, but how much money is it going to be? Because how many DJs are going to go, yeah, come on, look <laughs> so at my real hard just drive. Just take my money. Really <laughs> yeah, seriously. And how many yeah. DJs make enough money to justify paying that much? You know, exactly. There's only a handful exactly. that are actually, you know, that professional that that, can, that's can the point. That. what kind of knock-on effects is that going to have because yeah. you know if you're a dj and you know let's say you wanted to as i'm sure they all do want to do but let's say you wanted to stick by the law and then you see the fees you like can't be a dj anymore no, exactly that's it that's gone Oh yeah. well, but it's gonna be interesting to see how that shakes out anyway i just wanted to mention mm. it before before we finish that anything yeah. you want to plug your end before we, we wrap up with the show there's an, an album that I was, i've been working on for a uh, a, a band uh, over here called they're called Vienna Circle. You could, oh, you could awesome. go and hear that, but it's uh, it's progressive rock, so I know it's not to everyone's taste. But right. but yeah, that's been a long time coming. And in fact, if you read Prog Magazine, yeah, uh, uh, which is a good, very very good magazine, but um, but yeah, there'll be there'll be a sample on. on so you, the you produced CD. it? So I produced it. Yeah. Oh, awesome! Great. Yeah, I didn't even know you produce yeah. music. So no, okay. no, I've been I've been writing the vast majority of my like, the last two years. But okay, great. But this project started yeah a long time ago. And it's just been sort of burning along, and yeah, that's, so that, that's awesome. That's coming out on April twenty second. That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for your time, and great to have you on the show. And thanks so much for listening. Uh, this was kind of a interesting two way uh, episode of Digital Music Trends. You can find more on digitalmusictrends.com and follow me on Twitter on at digimusictrends. Have a great week, and until next time. And you can also follow the latest on DMT by liking the page on facebook.com slash digitalmusictrends.